Hi, everyone. Welcome to the State of the Onion. We are the Tor Project. My name is Steph. I do communications for Tor. So each of us is going to talk a little bit about what we do for the Tor Project. I'll talk about communications. Issa will talk about some updates from the organization and a couple of teams that aren't with us on the panel today. Nick will talk about what's been going on with the network team. Allison will talk about the community team. And Nathan will give us an update on Tor on mobile. So first, to get us started, I'm trying to answer this question, what is Tor? What is Tor? So if you hear someone talk about Tor, um, or you hear us say Tor, it could mean a lot of different things. So the Tor Project uh, is a nonprofit organization. It's based in Seattle. We have about 40 to 50 different employees. And we're also a large community of people around the world. So thousands of people are part of Tor. And what are we all doing together? We all believe that um, everyone should have private access to the open web, to an uncensored web. And so what we're doing together is creating software and a community that promotes these ideals. So Tor is also free and open source software for privacy and freedom online. So at the backbone of all Tor software is the Tor network. It's a decentralized network of volunteer-run servers around the world. So when you're using Tor software, before you reach the website that you're visiting, your traffic is encrypted three times as it passes over these relays. So we call the servers relays. And right now, there are over 6,000 uh, relays in the network. So if you follow Tor Atlas on Twitter, uh, it tweets out live updates for how the network looks. And so the easiest way to use Tor is Tor Browser. So Tor Browser is based off of Firefox with some extra privacy and security patches added on. And when you use Tor Browser, your traffic also goes over the Tor network where it's encrypted three times before it reaches the site you're visiting. And if you're in a country or on a network where there are blocked sites, then Tor can help you access those sites. So that's what we mean by privacy and freedom, the ability to browse online freely and go to the sites that, that you wish. So here are some of the protections that Tor Browser provides. It obscures your IP address, prevents network observation, location determination, blocks fingerprinting, prevents cross-site correlation, so a lot of trackers that could see what you're, ha see what you're doing on different sites and create a profile of your activity, uh, Tor helps stop that. Isolates cookies and scripts, it doesn't write anything to disk, and there's no browser history. So the protections of Tor browser are quite comprehensive. They're, they're unmatched by any other browser on the market today. And so if you want to browse the web, Tor browser helps with that. But the Tor network can also be used to publish with privacy. And so we call these onion services. And so this is where the traffic never leaves the network. There are no exit relays. You meet at rendezvous points in the network. And it's end-to-end -end encrypted, even without HTTPS. So this can be used for secure and private communications, file sharing, securing IoT devices, and configuring websites. So if there's a website that's been configured using Onion services, it will end in .onion. So here are some of the projects that are taking advantage of the protections that Onion services can provide. Global Leaks is a whistleblowing platform uh, for reporting corruption. SecureDrop, you've probably heard of. A lot of major news outlets around the world use SecureDrop so that sources can uh, leave tips to um, journalists anonymously. And OnionShare is a really cool example of how the Tor network can be used. It's a file sharing service, so you don't have to use a third party to share a file with someone. And uh, there are a lot of um, popular sites that now have Onion addresses. So here are a few of them. The New York Times, ProPublica, Privacy International, Facebook, BuzzFeed, and then all of the organizations using SecureDrop and, and GlobalLeaks. 
As part, of my, as part of my work on the communications team, we've been running a campaign to find out what are the, what are the good things that people are doing with, with Tor. So Tor is a force for good, but, and we don't, we don't track what people are doing, so we only know these stories if people tell us. So we've been collecting and sharing these stories, hashtag Tor stories. So I'll, I'll share a couple of those with you. This is a, a father who uses Tor to protect his, his children and his friends. They're bumping into issues regarding sex, drugs, and social media, and bullying. They're pretty open about a lot of these issues, so I try to be up to date with research. I use Tor to do the research and avoid telling Google and others that my children have these issues. This is someone who, who lives in Iran and has been using Tor for censorship circumvention. Tor changed my life in many ways. It made it possible to access information on YouTube, Twitter, Blogger, and countless other sites. This is an interesting example. This is a, a doctor in a political town. He says, I have patients who work on legislation that can mean billions of dollars. When I do research on diseases, diseases and treatments, or look into aspects of my patient's history. I'm well aware that search histories might be correlated to patient visits and leak information about their health, families, and personal lives. So I use Tor to do much of my, personal, much of my research when I think there is a risk of correlating it to patient visits. So as you can see, there are a lot of different reasons to use Tor, a lot of different ways that it can be used. Um, and we're collecting these stories. So if you, if you have a unique story to share or know of someone that has one, please send them our way. We'd love to hear it. And in terms of getting to connected with the communications team, you can sign up for our newsletter, follow us on social media. We're on most of the major outlets. Um, we are a nonprofit organization, so we're going to be talking about some of the different ways that you can get involved with different teams. But if you can't get involved, we would love to have your support in the form of a donation. Uh, we have a new fundraising team, and we just made some cool updates to how we accept donations. We now accept a wide range of, of cryptocurrencies to our site. So if that's, if that's your thing, you should check out uh, our new updates. We have several wallets and unique currencies. So um, if you have any feedback about that, please let us know. Um, if we don't get to your question today, then please come visit us at our booth. We have a lot of stickers and teas, and we'll be happy to answer any other questions that you may have. So now I'll pass it to Issa for some more updates. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Isabella. I'm the new executive director for Tor. I've been at Tor for a few years, since 2015. A Tor user for many more years than that. Um, I guess, I don't know, 2005 or something that I started using. Um, but uh, yes, um, I started as ED officially last November. So I want to share a little bit about set of goals that establish, like, it's not coming from my mind alone. This is things that was like common sense within the community and the organization. So this is things that we are trying to get organized and get really good at for the next like three years or so. Um, so stable income flows and diverse funding base is extremely important for sustainability in the long go, um, as well as a robust organization that meets those needs. We have grown a lot, like Tor staff has like, um, I think a double in the last few years. Um, also we want, as we grow, we don't want to lose our culture. So this is one of the things that we are like focus a lot as well right now, like in the, identify and articulate our culture so we know what it is so we don't lose as we grow. And um, also we, like as the staff said, we are very uh, strong on like trying to uh, bring Tor to be recognized as a strong privacy tool. And we are working really hard on that, trying to collect stories, trying to show the world what it is, explain the technology, and most of all, try to explain to the people that that is, I'm going to say something very strong, but that is no dark web. And there's a lot of mystification about that and what that is. 
and the media use that. So we are working really hard on educating people about our technology and that mystification around the term. And we're trying to really get people to understand our mission and our, the benefits of uh, such technology. Uh, for the product, for the side of that, the technology, we want any person on the planet to that be able to access the network. And once they access the network, to be able to do anything they want to do on the network. So that is a lot of work towards that uh, from our own side, but also side of like partnering with people and educating people, CDNs especially, so they don't block uh, any IP that comes from Tor and things like that. Um, but if we are successful on those things, nothing will happen if we don't have a strong network. So we also want our network to be diverse, healthy, stable, and can scale and take all those folks in. So we are going to focus on that. People are going to talk a lot about this. I'm going to try to bring to you some perspective of like what this means in reality, right? Like what are the work we're doing that brings us to this? So any person on the access to our network, we, are, we just created an anti-censorship team. We didn't have dedicated people inside of the organization, only focus on that. People from network team was kind of like doing double job <laughs> on that. Also, we have UNI, Open Observatory of Network Interference. Not everybody have heard about this project inside of Tor. Uh, come to a booth, like it's a project that monitors uh, censorship around the world. Our Tor browser 8.0, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but has new features that help people uh, the usability part of Tor when you're launching the Tor browser and connecting to the network and you cannot do that, how you can circumvent the censorship. So we're trying to make that easier for people to do. And also, accessibility goes to website. Website from our website right now is terrible. It's a lot of information, nothing's translated. So we redesigned the website because once it's localize it, that is a no-brainer for also like getting people in who don't speak English and cannot um, understand English. So all these works come from like all the way to circumvent censorship against store, but also all the way to just like translating the website. Um, Uni, a little bit of what Uni does. This is some of the tasks. You download Uni probe on your cell phone. You can run those tasks. Um, they have collected. Uh, that's from 200 different countries. Here's some stats so for you to have an idea. This data is also public. You can analyze this data through the UNI website and they have an API for that. And this is a little bit of what I was talking about. This is animated GIF, so you're not gonna actually see, <laughs> but uh, hopefully we can share the slides and you can see the GIF, but on our website you can see that. But this is a feature that we changed when you were going to request a bridge. You had to send an email, do, get out of Tor, and do a lot of work. Right now, all you do is on this screen, you're gonna see a capture. You solve that capture, we send you three bridges, and that's it. You don't need to leave, you don't need to understand what, what you need to put on the subject line of the email, you don't need to do any of that anymore. And this is a huge deal, because people got really lost on that step. This is the new website, you all seen, but it's about to launch next week, and we are translating that. Uh, hopefully, this is focused on the new user, really focused on the new user. We're gonna build all the portals for other type of content, but uh, we're trying to explain everything that Dart does on that. Um, a little bit about, this is about reusability, like I said. So the Tor Browser 8.0 came with a year and a half of work of us learning what are the issues with our users. We don't collect data, so we need to travel around the world and actually like talk with people and learn from them. Um, so we put a bunch of effort here. Uh, starting with um, this little onion you see on the top on the URL bar, that is an indicator that we created for on your site. So you would see the padlock normally for like security indicator. We created our own visual language for when someone is accessing our onion site, because that is and we believe this is a different type of property, so we should treat that way. Um, we also define the user lifetime inside of Tor, so we identify the phase of onboarding as an extremely important one for educational phase. Uh, so we created, uh, this is also what's going to be an animated GIF, so if you click on the globe, now is uh, on the icon on the corner of the About Tor, the land page of the browser. You're gonna go to an onboarding process that teaches you the most important uh, features in the browser. So uh, we are incorporating a lot of uh, learning experience within the, the user experience in the browser in general. 
Um, also, we switch that green globe to something <laughs> that is more close to our onion, uh, so we have new icons coming out, small details. Um, the whole uh, Tor button that had the security settings for Tor, like security slider, uh, we're moving that to actually the place where configurations happens in the browser, where people expect that to happen. And we are creating language as well to give an indicator to the, to the user which level of security they are. So they can more understand like what's going on, what certain things are not running on their website when they're accessing, because depending on the level of security you are, we're blocking more things. So certain elements of a website might not run, JavaScript stuff. Um, so we're doing that as well, trying to like break it down and make it easier for people to understand what's going on. Our goal is to uh, enable the user to be able to customize the experience according to their needs. Because the more power they have on doing that, and we believe they're gonna stay, because they will be able to, for instance, if I wanna lower my security level because I trust the website I'm visiting, I will be able to understand how to control that experience. If I wanna put my security level higher because I don't trust where I am right now, and I really like, I wanna be protected, so I can do that as well. Um, again, localization, we added nine new languages recently, and we are, translating everything, so uh, those are some examples of a localized top, um, browser homepage, but we also translated our support website, um, and we are doing more. So we're gonna launch a community portal for uh, projects that are related, like people who train Tor, people who run relay operators, people who are, uh, wanna help each other to create on your servers. There's gonna be a lot of that. Um, also, we are creating dev, Tor Project Dog, which is all the free software aspect of Tor, is gonna leave there, so if you wanna contribute the code or get a copy of the code, you can go there for other projects. Uh, working a lot, again, like we have another batch of UX uh, improvements for this year on, on your service experience, but other as well. And with the new censorship team, we are excited as well with like all the things that they're gonna be coming up uh, during the course of the year. They have already uh, been planning stuff and doing a roadmap and uh, trying to uh, work on the pluggable transport part of Tor and try to bring new pluggable transports as well that are less expensive for Ashram but more expensive for the sensor to block and identify. So I think this is it from my slides, so I'm passing to Nick. All right, thanks boss. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nick. I work on the network team we're the group that makes the software that makes the network go and that makes clients connect to the network and generally good stuff like that. I wish I had like two or three whole hours to tell you about all the cool stuff in the last year, but I've got maybe five to seven minutes to give everybody else enough time. So my apologies about all the stuff that I'm not gonna cover as much as I would like to. Uh, but please feel free to find me after this talk. I'll be at the tour booth outside and I can talk about this stuff for longer than you want to listen to me. So, our current top goals are basically to make Tor as secure as possible, and to make Tor work for everybody, and to let everybody work on Tor. Why those in particular? I'm looking towards what's Tor going to be like in 20 to 50 years, in terms of what can we provide for internet privacy. I think what we need to provide is something that can be ubiquitous and that can scale to cover as much of humanity as possible. And it has to give them as much security as possible. So we need to look for security things that actually do scale to everyone. This is part, it's much easier to make a privacy tool that only delivers anonymity
pattern based on current research to try to find out what can be simultaneously affordable and do some good against different kinds of attacks. Our first attack that we're going to work on is the so-called website fingerprinting attack because we think that one might be more tractable than others. We have a good in-progress proposal. We're tracking it as proposal 295 for new relay crypto. It will strengthen the cryptography on the network. I hope any cryptographers in the room will get a chance to look at it and uh, try to pick some holes in it because we're probably going to deploy it or something like it. I'll tell you um, another security improvement once it is more ubiquitous in our code will be moving to Rust. I'll say more there later. Currently the Tor daemon is in C, which is a, a good choice for several decades ago, but is sort of showing its age and making me nervous. Um, we are mer merging a cool tool that I wish I could talk about even more fully called PrivCount. What PrivCount will do is it will allow relays to report statistics in a privacy preserving way so that the only statistics that anyone can recover are overall statistics over the entire network. And even the relays themselves will not be tracking at any given time their individual contributions to the statistics. It's using some Shamir secret splitting and some neat homomorphic encryption tricks to make it so that um, you can say count the number of users you've seen or the number of logins you've seen without actually um, or rather, so we can get a count like that across the whole network without ever actually tracking on an individual relay. So that's a security improvement that we need to do. And another one we've, that's very security relevant, we have a new, this one's in Python for any Python programmers who want to help out, bandwidth measurement tool written in Python. It's called SBWS. It should go live later this year. And its purpose is to measure the bandwidth of relays in the Tor network. This is really important because without that, you could just show up and say, hey, I'm a relay and I have infinite bandwidth capacity. Please give me an infinite share of the traffic. And that would enable some interesting attacks. In the future, one, some stuff we're working hard on is even better crypto. We want to, I wanted to be post-quantum this time um, when I talked to you last year. Sorry that that didn't happen, but we're moving ahead. We just need somebody to do the coding and even better routing choices. There are lots of proposals now for how to decide which relays to connect to. Um, a lot of them are frustrated by the current kind of spaghetti nature of some of our code, but we're going out there. I I'm sorry, what does the 10 mean? 10 minutes left, oh sorry, I should hurry up. Um, to make Tor go for everybody, we've done some good stuff. Fortunately, our slides are online, so uh, you can check them out. The, one of the ones I'm most excited about here, though, is stuff that we've done to make Tor better for developers. We have reorganized our whole code base so that things are actually in somewhat rational locations. We actually have CI right now. You don't need to be afraid that your commit will break the whole world if you are sending stuff for the first time. And we are now embeddable. You can stick Tor in your application and launch it yourself and see how that goes. It's Still a work in progress, so please report bugs. And yeah, if you want to join in, uh, download the so Tor source code, look at the doc hacking directory, and that should give you some stuff to get started. Also look at the volunteer page on our website, and that has lots of links to other programs we work on that aren't Tor. Now I'll pass it on to Allison. Nathan, sorry. Nathan, I told you not, you were sitting in the wrong order. Out of order packet delivery. So. So I, uh, I'm Nathan with Guardian Project, but I've been a Tor contributor and member for many years. And so, as Nick said, we're trying to make Tor for everybody. And I've sort of been uh, with Guardian Project at the, the vanguard of that effort in the sense of like, hey, can't we run Tor on a phone? Can't we run Tor on ARM? Can't we run Tor in limited RAM memory networks? And we've been doing it for a long time. But um, now, you know, all of that time we've been testing it and getting millions of users, but now Tor itself at the core has adopted our mission as their mission, which is great, um, around Tor for everybody. And so if you've been using Orfox, it's now Tor Browser for Android. Um, Orfox is being, you know, you should probably stop using it and just use Tor Browser for Android, even though it's alpha, it's way better. It's the latest. It's the Tor Browser team is doing mobile and desktop together. It's integrated. All the stuff you've heard is happening together. So 
don't send me any more support IRC Twitter messages about Orfox, please. Thank you very much. Okay, so does that mean Orbot, which is our Android app, is no longer needed? Of course not. Um, we want Orbot is going to do, it, it already is being used for other apps, right? Integrated with many other apps and other things that can't build Tor in. And we're also really focusing on things like providing an easy VPN for um, unblocking apps and also getting it on all sorts of crazy devices like TVs and Chromebooks and IoT and cars. And we really want to make Orbot like even smaller and even more efficient. So Orbot's like nine megabytes now and we want to do like a three megabyte version. So it can really just be anywhere um, for anybody who um, needs not just the web but all the other kind of apps. We have been really focused on supporting mobile developers. So as Nick said, awesome progress by the Tor network team on getting Tor embeddable. You can run it in a thread now and in your process and restart it and do all sorts of other things. So there's a, a lot more libraries for developers, including Tor Android, Tor Android Proxy Library, Tor Android Services, which is coming, and then also on iOS. There's work on pluggable transports, which is a whole other topic, as well as um, if you want to build it into apps there. So this idea that Tor should just be this invisible thing built in everywhere is, is happening, and we can help with that. Um, like I said, um, Onion Browser 3, I know there's lots of Apple and iOS fans in the room here, um, but it shows what's possible even in the most constricted closed environments, right? In our world, a lot of people say, oh, Apple and iPhone is more secure if you're a journalist. That might be so, so we still want to bring Tor to them, um, and we're doing that. The other exciting thing is like how many other apps are building on Tor and using it in interesting ways. So Briar um, is a really awesome peer-to-peer -peer mobile messaging, onion-to-onion -onion, um, chat service that's doing great work and really pushing Tor to make mobile onions peer-to-peer -peer happen. Haven is an app that I co-designed with Freedom of the Press Foundation, Edward Snowden, and that ha is an onion server itself on your phone to have like a secure IoT connection. Ftroid is a free software uh, repository that supports app stores as onion sites, which is super exciting, and a lot of great work by Hans Steiner and others there. And then Open Archive is a, um, a tool that's published to the Internet Archive, but now is working with Nextcloud over Tor as onions as a way to, for human rights organizations to back up media. So there's a lot more coming here and apps that are supporting Tor as a feature. So, um, so you know, go to the Tor places and they can point you to where mobile people are. You can also come find us on GitLab um, and Matrix, which we're a big fan of now, so come to our um, fully encrypted public room with 500 people. It works pretty well. So uh, thank you and I'll be around. Turn it over to Alison. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Allison. I will be so fast in telling you about uh, the community team. Um, internally in Tor, we refer to the work of the community team as helping people who help Tor help people. If you want to join the community team, you will demonstrate your commitment by saying this 10 times fast or by coming up with a better way of referring to what we do on the team. Um, so. Uh, the community team does a whole bunch of different things related to outreach, training, user support, localization. I've listed the members of the team up on here because, number one, we're friendly people with names, although I did not include our IRC handles, whoops. But if you come on IRC and you say, um, excuse me, where's Cat or whatever, like Cat will show up. Um, we work on uh, providing support for relay operators, um, community liaising around um, different tour communities around the world, doing translation, uh, research, and then specific outreach to uh, certain countries. Some of the things that we've been focusing on this year in particular are, number one, Global South outreach, so working with members of our communities in places where historically Tor and other free software projects have not been as well represented as they are in, for example, Europe or the United States. We've been giving talks, having meetups, um, doing trainings in m so many different countries. I don't have the time to name them all. If you come to the booth, I'll talk to you about the specific ones. Since we are a human rights project, that outreach work has been focused on um, human rights users. And this has um, informed a lot of the UX work that Issa talked about already. So essentially what we do is we go to places we work with our communities there, we listen to them, we hear about their use cases for Tor, um, and then we make Tor function better um, according to their specific needs. Um, and then we do a whole bunch of other kind of like resource development and um, 
helping them like continue doing work on tour in their local places. We had our first Global South tour meeting in 2018, which was really exciting. We had it in Mexico City. Dozens of community members came to our open hack days. Um, so we hope to have more of these in the future. Some of the big things that have happened from the relay advocacy side, um, we have created a whole bunch of new amazing resources for our relay operators. Um, so in the past, you know, we've, we have all these relay operators, they, they operate the more than 6,000 relays in the network, but if you were um, a relay operator and you needed help, you know, you have to kind of go internally within the relay community to ask for certain things and get questions answered. And that is generally a pretty good resource, but what's different now this year is we have a full-time person whose whole job it is to assist relay operators, help keep them happy, um, kind of understand what their issues are and help solve them. And he also runs a number of meetups that are just for relay operators. So here's a flyer from one that happened in Barcelona. There have been a bunch in uh, Canada. Um, there's some coming up at IFF and at the uh, Pet Symposium. And then for folks who can't make the in-person meetups, there are now regular IRC meetings for tour relay operators and people who want to be tour relay operators. Oop, duplicate slide. Library Freedom Project is uh, under the tour umbrella and part of the community team. And I'm going to kind of skip over this because I have a talk tomorrow at 1.35 where I want to tell you all about what's going on with Library Freedom Project. But I will just say one thing that was a big success for us this year was um, something that we did with the Toronto Public Library. So essentially what Library Freedom Project does is we teach librarians about privacy and surveillance and free software is a huge component of that, and so is Tor. So we do, um, we do trainings and outreach. We, do, um, we help libraries run Tor relays. And the Toronto Public Library decided this year to start using Tor Browser on um, all of their public PCs. So it's still kind of you know, going through its pilot phase, but this is a huge deal. Toronto Public Library is one of the biggest public libraries in North America. Um, it has a really strong reputation, and they have been pushing really hard for privacy um, over the last few years. And so Tor Browser was a really obvious choice for them to continue that uh, really incredible work. And their community is very supportive of it. And also they won some awards for it too, which is cool. So some things that are upcoming for us. Um, Issa mentioned the community portal, but I just want to mention it again because it's going to be a really incredible um, resource page with materials for people who want to teach other people about Tor, um, for people who want to learn about Tor. It's going to have like kind of really simple things for getting information out to your community. I'll tell you some more tomorrow about Library Freedom Institute and what we're doing with that. We have been expanding our translations more um, languages for Tor means more people around the world who can use it. I think one of the themes that you've heard from us is that we're scaling it to many, many people. We want people of all different technical abilities and all walks of life to be using Tor. And then upcoming, we have some community team people who will be at IFF and also at RightsCon. So if you're going to any of those conferences, please come say hi. And then lastly, that is how you can contact the community team. We're also in Tor's IRC channels on OFTC. And we are out of time. Um, we do have some time for questions, though, I think. I've been shown a, a thing that says QA. Yeah. 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 We would love to take questions now. Just a quick note. Um, so I haven't been at many other talks. I don't know if this is a problem here yet or not. But a question is one or two sentences long and ends with a question mark. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Hello, it's up. We have 10 minutes for questions, so if you have a question, please line up right here uh, or raise your hand and I can bring the microphone to you. I mean, I can go. Hello? Testing, perfect. Okay. I th thank you for existing. Uh, <clears throat> to, what ex to what extent is it a problem for someone to set up a short-term relay? And you can define short-term any way you want. I'm curious about that. And the other part of it is, uh, to what extent might someone be targeted because 
uh, somehow it's discovered that there's something like a Tor relay happening in their possession. Yes, very good. So uh, for the first question, uh, what are, like, it if it's productive, I guess, like it to run a short-term relay. So like it relays has a life cycle. So it depends on like, you don't turn on a relay and it's automatically recognizing and put it as part of the network that a user might use to connect to the web. So if you run for a very short time period, you might not achieve the credibility that our life cycle exists for one of the reasons so for your relay to achieve certain credibility so we can add you to the count that our users are going to use. So if you run for a short time, you not might achieve that and not actually contribute to the network. So um, on the top of my head, I don't know. <laughs> um, if you're only going to do it for a day, it's not that useful. If you can do it for a couple of weeks, it will be more useful than not. But we try, people with much worse intentions than yours have run many, many short-term relays and the network is robust against that. So don't worry about hurting the network with like a relay that goes down too fast. One thing we're working with on mobile is how to allow to make your phone a bridge for temporary for a few hours. So the idea is every night your phone sits there for six hours, four hours, whatever. Um, and you should be able to help people get to tour. So we're working on Snowflake is a feature idea using WebRTC. So you could run it for a few hours and be helpful. Yeah, this time next year, I think we'll be talking a lot about Snowflake. Yeah, that's a great point. It depends also on the type of relay you're using. This one would be super useful. Um, regarding also like uh, threats against someone who is running a relay, that also depends on the type of relay you're using and where the country you are also as well. But like uh, in most cases, uh, people who are running extra relays, uh, we ask them to not run from their homes and run from like data centers because extra relays is all the traffic going out to the normal internet. And uh, maybe there are some activity there that might be suspicious and you might receive a letter. So if that is mixed with your home traffic, it's not nice. So, but in, in general, most people who do receive those type of letters, the, we do have on our relay guide, uh, at the booth we have like more information about that, some simple uh, letter format that you can reply to it that explains that it's infrastructure, it's not your traffic, you didn't generate it, and then most of the time, get, put, put those away. You know, it's not a problem to the person. So we have an IRC question. Question for Nick. What post-quantum encryption system are you planning to use, and how confident are you that it will really be quantum resistant? Probably something lattice-based, not all that confident, we hope to make it swappable and use it in a hybrid mode. Currently, Kyber looks good to me, but I am not a cryptographer and I'm not qualified to actually judge this stuff. Uh, so, thank you guys for the great work. And you guys talk about the Snowflake, which is like bridging for like anti censorship kind of stuff. So, I was wondering if there are other anti censorship uh, work done, like for example, for the like relays or exit nodes that. Uh, like for example, that, that, that let's say China. Like for people running accident in China, is really not as like not possible. Is there like ways you guys are trying to make that easier, or like uh, running not not accident node like uh, normal relays uh, in China? Because I, I remember like buying a few months, uh, I was trying to use my server to do relays, even though it's outside of China, but I'm using it. Yeah, in China, and it, it really quickly got uh, blocked. So I was wondering if there's, uh, just talk more about uh, anti-censorship stuff, I guess. I'm sorry, sorry. Um, okay, I can, I can try. Uh, as I understand it, the question is about like, um, trying to make it useful to run Tor infrastructure for places that are censored and even in places that are censored. Um, so right now, Tor's network topology assumes that all of the Tor network is able to reach the rest of the Tor network. It's somewhat resilient to some failures there, but it doesn't really take them into account. So as it stands, um, running a relay or an exit 
inside of some place that is heavily censored or very blocked is going to look like a pretty buggy relay or exit. Um, we are working on stuff to try to do better network topologies, and we're going to have to do better network topologies anyway as we continue to scale because, as I'm sure you can imagine, um, this kind of a topology where everyone potentially talks to everyone else does not scale to 100,000 relays. Um, I'm not really sure which resource you would run out of first, whether it would be kernel buffers or TCP ports, but um, as we do that kind of stuff, we're probably going to get to a point where we can be more useful to run servers in places like that. The anti-censorship story in general is way more complicated than I can do much justice in the time that we have. Uh, the main challenges are telling the censored users about ways to connect to the network that in a way that does not immediately tell the censors what they should block that they didn't know to block before. And then once you've done that, having the communication run in a way that is not immediately identifiable and um, detectable. The, the engineering challenge on those is to figure out how to make those two things very integrated and seamless and invisible from the user's perspective while making them easy to swap out very quickly from a deployment perspective because there's a lot of arms race element there and you need to change these things pretty often in order to get around blocking. And please come find us afterwards. I'd love to talk about this more. We have two more minutes for questions. Uh, another IRC question says, a fellow Skull Space member asks, how do you vet relay operators? We do not vet relay operators. We keep a close eye on the network, and a lot of volunteers keep a close eye on the network, looking for large numbers of people showing up quickly, looking for any exits, tampering with traffic, trying to do men in the middle on certificates, uh, and so on. We look for nodes with suspicious similar behavior. And we also look for some other suspicious stuff that um, I don't really keep an eye on myself because I'm just making the software. However, I think we need more people looking at the nodes, the size of the network, the growth rate of the network, and so on. There is a tension between trying to know all the operators, know who they are, know where they live and make sure that they're actually doing it for the right reasons and not actually wanting to track down and organize and centralize all of the operation of the network. I think that long term, the direction I'm trying to go in is to limit the damage that hostile nodes can do and to try to limit the amount of stuff that gets done over the network that is potentially dangerous in the presence of hostile nodes. Um, and if anybody's got any great ideas for how to do that, then we'll be here all day. All right, let's do one more question and then we're done. Okay. Towards the goal of enabling all Tor users to access all online services, what do we do about those webmasters that block Tor users? Should we be writing some angry letters? Oh. I think we should write kind letters to them. We should tell them that we're friendly people, that they maybe didn't realize that we are a human rights-based project and that they're possibly unaware that they're blocking people um, living in you know, oppressive places. So, I mean, we do, one thing that we're working on for our, some of our new resources is materials for talking to other people about Tor in friendly and accessible ways. All right, thank you, everyone. Sure. Thanks, everybody. Is that your coffee? Yes. <laughs>